Hey everybody, it's Don. On this episode of The Naturalist, I'm here on a brisk late March day in 2024 to take a walk at Fort Hill State Memorial. So let's go. Let's take a quick look at the information kiosk um, here at Fort Hill. Fort Hill, first of all, is so named because it is an ancient earthwork of the Hopewell culture that, uh, that basically surrounds the rim of the top of the, of the hill. Uh, it's been named Fort Hill, although it's not thought to have, have had any, you know, uh, fort aspect to it in terms of warfare and things. It's probably a ceremonial structure, but it's one of our larger um, earthworks in Ohio among the many earthworks that, that are found throughout this state, from the Adena and Hopewell culture and so forth. And so you can find some information all about that aspect of Fort Hill. Fort Hill is also a just a beautiful forest. There's about 400 total acres here, I believe. It's currently managed by the Ark of Appalachia Preserve System uh, with the help of the Ohio Historical Society. So this is just a beautiful walk any time of the year. I'm here in early spring where the spring wildflowers are just getting started but uh, we can take a good look at, at the earthworks, the big trees you can find here, and uh, a little bit about the, uh, the flowers that are just emerging. Okay, let's go. My intention today is to just traverse a couple of the trail choices there are here at Fort Hill and uh, stop periodically and show you some of the highlights along the way. So we are about right here on this map so far. And what I intend to do first is to head up what's called the Fort Trail. And that will take me uh, to the top of Fort Hill. And we'll take a look at the, the fort itself, the ceremonial enclosure at the top of the hill, and a few of the natural highlights up on top of the hill. And then we'll descend probably down the other side and walk part of the gorge, um, the gorge trail and take a look at the creek over there and a couple of the, uh, the highlights that we can see along the way. And I'll just stop periodically and point some interesting things out here at Fort Hill, which has really a lot to offer. At this intersection, I'm only a short ways from where I started. Uh, you have a choice of, of taking the trail to the left, which is called the Deer Trail. And that basically skirts around the base of Fort Hill or the side of Fort Hill, and then uh, joins the Gorge Trail on the other side of the hill. Um, or we can take the Fort Trail, which is this trail, and that's what we're going to do. This Fort Trail is, it will be fairly steep, and it's going to take us up on top of the hill sort of right away, um, and then get up on top, which is relatively flat. It's kind of like a mesa-topped hill here, and so that's what we're going to do. And then we'll come down the other side and rejoin the Gorge Trail. All right, so I'm going to proceed up the Fort Trail. One of the things that becomes very quickly obvious here when you visit Fort Hill is how heavily forested it is. Uh, it's a beautiful tract of old growth or at least older growth forest, um, which is increasingly rare in a state like Ohio. Uh, this, this area is part of the old growth forest network. It's been part of that network for about, I think almost 10 years. And that network helps to preserve and recognize old growth forests uh, basically across the U.S. Uh, and beyond. Uh, so there's a number of tracts of land like this in the state um, that, are, that are have been recognized by the Old Growth Forest Network, and this is one of them. And so I'm just part way up that Fort Hill Trail, and I'm going to, or Fort Trail, I guess it's called, and I just want to point out a few of the tree highlights I'm seeing on my way. So first, if you look around at the landscape, I'm here on late March, 2024. There are some spring wildflowers just starting to peak out. We'll look at a few, but I'm not gonna exhaust that here just yet because we're far from the peak spring wildflower season and um, things aren't very far along just yet. So we'll be able to see those things all over the place. But I want to show you some tree highlights and like in front of me, for example, on the right, right here is a white oak. Okay, and then here's a really nice large red oak, northern red oak. Uh, that thing is about three feet in diameter. Um, 
again, you know, my, my age estimation on a tree like that's probably 200 years old or more. Across the little stream valley over there, I see a really large tulip tree, also in the same size category. Again, those grow pretty fast, so that one's probably only about 100 years old or so. Uh, and then there are some really large beech trees I'm seeing in the distance there as well. So here we're in an oak, maple, beech forest. Um, I'm also seeing hickories, various species. And um, what there were formerly now, lots of ashes here, white ash, for example. And, and over here we can see a, a dead one that was killed by the deadly emerald ash borer that I've talked about many times. And so this forest was filled with large ash trees that are now basically largely gone, except the young ones, okay, that are, have been, were, were too small to be attacked when the beetle really tore through this area. Um, and, uh, but will be attacked eventually if once they get large enough, all right? So let's keep going. And I'm, again, just starting my ascent of, of uh, the fort and just pausing here to look at some of these massive trees you're gonna see along the way when you do the same walk. It's a pretty crisp day, probably upper 40s, heading toward the mid 50s. Uh, like I was saying, the plants are a little bit uh, not, not, sh not showing much yet, but I hear a lot of birds. Birds are starting to pick up. I hear a lot of woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers. I see chickadees. Uh, flickers, lots of things like that. But I noticed over here as I was walking a uh, this huge northern red oak that split. I'm gonna try to maybe get to the other side of it so the, the lighting's better. But this tree, as you can see, is probably, again, in the order of three and a half, maybe four feet in diameter. <clears throat> and it got split. It must have, you know, it was obviously a two, a double trunk tree up there and it, near the top where I'm pointing there, there was a hollow that weakened the tree sort of from the top. Okay, it looked healthy from below, I'm sure, initially, but winds here have totally split this huge uh, trunk off. And the one thing you can really see in this split is the color of the wood. Okay, so this is northern red oak, which gets part of its name, at least, from that real reddish wood that it, that it uh, exhibits. Okay, and again, that's, that's uh, highly valued wood for uh, furniture and flooring and things like that. White oak's probably more highly valued, but uh, red oak is, is certainly valued as well. Okay, and that rich red color is, is, is the, you know, the source of its moniker. So I've been hiking uphill for at least a quarter mile or so. That's your, what the initial ascent of the Fort Trail is like. Stopping here and there, taking a look at a few things. And I just want to point out a massive tree here, uh, which one of the bigger ones I've seen on the way up so far outside of those red oaks. There's a huge tulip tree right here. And I just measured this thing. It's about 44 inches in diameter. A uh, little, little under four feet in diameter, and that's a that's a large tulip tree. Um, I did an episode at a place called Davy Woods, which is well known for its massive tulip trees, and uh, this is the size tree that you can find there fairly commonly. Uh, but they're not uncommon here either. I don't know if this is the biggest one around, but this is right next to the Fort Trail, so anybody could see it. And this is a fine example of a tulip tree. Okay, nearly four feet in diameter. Okay, at this point, I'm also approaching the start of the formal earthwork here at Fort Hill. And uh, the Fort Trail will take us through like an opening in that, in the, in the earthwork, the ceremonial earthwork. Uh, as I described down below, this is a mountaintop earthwork, uh, a, a stone and dirt wall uh, that basically surrounds the, the top of the flat top of the of the hill of Ford Hill. It's thought to be ceremonial. Didn't think there was, they don't think that there was any, uh, you know, fort aspect of it at all. 
uh, but it has multiple openings through it. And so we're seeing the lower outer edge of that wall from down here. And until you get up there and up and close to it, you can't really tell it was a built wall by, by humans. Uh, it looks pretty natural from here. But once we get up closer to it, I'll stop and we'll take a look at it a little bit more closely. All right, we turned a corner on Fort Trail. We're still skirting along the, the base of the earthwork, which is up there to our right, which we'll cross here soon. I just want to point out that we started to turn in the southern direction on this hill. And one thing you do, you notice right away, is how much warmer and likely drier the this side of the hill is. We started by coming up a north, somewhat east facing part of the hill. And, um, you know, that influences a lot of things like the, the vegetation, for example, that, that grows in, in sort of drier, warmer soils. And this part of the forest is just as beautiful. Um, I do notice right away a lot more sugar maple in this part of the woods. And I know they're abundant. There's a lot of pawpaw in the understory here. This this area is rich with pawpaw. And those pawpaw are just starting to put out their flower buds. So I wanted to point out that to you. Because I did a, a pawpaw episode. Okay, so let's see. Hopefully you folks can see that. Those are developing flower buds of pawpaw. Okay, they're not open yet, which is a good thing. Because in my pawpaw episode, I described how pawpaw flowers open fairly early. And they're often subject to freezes uh, because they open so early. And that really can influence your, you know, the, the, the possible fruit set that you get in a pawpaw tree. So you want them to stay in bud like that a little bit longer. We had a very cold night last night uh, in southwestern Ohio, probably the same here got into the mid twenties. If these things were open fully at that time, they could very well have frozen and that would basically eliminate them as becoming for the, for the chance of becoming a fruit this year. Okay. And so, uh, but Fort Hill, these hillsides here at Fort Hill, there's a lot of blowdowns here, by the way, we've also had a lot of winds this spring and these blowdowns are, have occurred all throughout Southern Ohio. But uh, this whole, all these hillsides are just coated in the understory with pawpaw. Okay, they're all around me here. There's tons of flowers here at the moment. If these things all set fruit, there'll be abundant fruit at Ford Hill this coming fall. All right, now I said I wasn't going to talk about too many wildflowers just yet because the peak of their display is yet to come. But there is one I wanted to show you because it's early and it's gone pretty quickly. <clears throat> And that is, let's see, there's a few to choose from here. But that's this flower here, the white one, okay? And here, those are blood roots. And uh, they, they put up a, a flowering bud, a green bud that then opens into this flower. It doesn't last very long. There's a single leaf at the base which is, uh, I'm trying to unfurl it here for you, which is uh, really interesting. It's a, it has a lobed appearance to it and um, kind of waxy, but it doesn't last long. So I can see all around this area, for example, right here is a blood root that's passed and that's starting to produce its seed capsule there. Okay, the petals are all gone. Here's one that's stuck under leaves and it just, it just dropped its petals. And it's again starting to produce its fruit and seed capsule there. Here's another one that's just come out. So we're kind of at peak season for blood root, but by one week from now, essentially, these things wouldn't be visible. Okay, they, they all you would see is those developing seed capsules and you wouldn't even realize the blood roots were, were here. All of those leaves can last quite a while. All right, so those, those will be here. All right, now there's some teaser. There's a lot of other things coming along and I'll see what, uh, what I decide to stop and talk about as we go. I decided to highlight this flower for you because there's a nice individual here right near the trail, standing nice and tall and proud. So this is cut leaf toothwort. 
and Cardamony concatenata. This is a native plant in the mustard family. It's an early spring flowering plant. Uh, very common in Ohio, all throughout southwestern Ohio, the whole state really. And um, it's a very important host plant for some of our native biodiversity, including some early spring butterflies, like the falcate orange tip butterfly, which is something we study. And I'll talk about more uh, in the future. But um, it has these, I mean, again, another one of these plants is very aptly named. It has these very divided leaves, uh, therefore cut leaf toothwort. There are other toothworts uh, that are, are, you know, that vary from that. And this one has the most divided leaves, I guess. Um, this thing makes a nice whitish purplish flower. Those, petal, those flowers would have four petals. That's a common trait in the mustard family is making flowers with four petals. And those flowers are often white or yellow in this family. Uh, with some variation, some purplish, uh, even bluish flowers as well. And uh, so this is a nice spring, what we call a spring ephemeral. Flowers early, it will set seed. The plants will remain uh, green probably till um, toward the end of May, I'd say into May, and then they will senesce and die and you won't even know they're there. But it, they're, these are perennials, so it'll come back the next year from a bulb that's fairly deep underground, several inches underground is its storage organ for the next year. And it'll come back and uh, it's a nice, uh, you know, indicator of spring. Just an incredible number of blowdowns in this area. We've had a lot of high winds this year, but this area has had high winds often, taking out a lot of trees in this spot. I remember this park being temporarily closed down. The trails closed down, uh, let's see, maybe about 10 years ago, I think, because there was so much of this happening. As you can see, these remnants, these are black walnuts, ashes, oaks, sugar maples. Uh, you know, you couldn't even get around uh, because it, there were so many trees strewn everywhere. So and you, you can see these have all been cut apart in time. So just uh, just to comment on, on blowdowns, this site I know has suffered quite a bit from blowdowns. That's a normal thing. But, you know, with ex increasingly extreme weather events, um, we'll see more of this going into the future at, in our in our forested areas that have tall trees and susceptible to, to wind throw. Uh, so it's just a taste of what more, what's to come. All right, so we are right here. We're now we've walked uh, just along this skirted along the base of the of the earth and earthwork to the south side of Fort Hill. Okay, north is up, south is down. And so we're going to continue on Fort, the Fort Trail for a ways. Uh, and then um, at some point, we're going to get up on top and take a look around up on top. Uh, but we will also drop down to take a look at the gorge as well. So uh, this is a place where you can, where the gorge trail links to Fort Trail, if you wish to uh, hop from one to the other. And uh, But we're going to stay in the Fort Trail for now and then drop down to the gorge trail in a bit. Well, I decided I'd stop and take a look at another flower since I'm seeing these flowering quite abundantly. These are white trout lilies. Okay, so they make this beautiful green and purple spotted leaf. And uh, again, there are, this one is has mostly white petals with you know, yellow stamens. There's a lot of pollen in there. These would be important pollen sources for early pollinators. Um, this has a a close relative that's yellow, called the golden star lily. It has some other names as well. I haven't seen any of those. Those are much more rare. But I'm seeing these white trout, trout, trout lilies in, in bloom all around me with these nodding flowers. And so I thought I'd highlight those before they're gone. These are picky too. I, I've had these planted in my yard for about 20 years. And each year we've seen the leaves but we have never once had a flower produced by all the trout lilies that we've had in our yard. I have no idea why. It just is not the right spot for them, I guess. Uh, so they hang on, they persist, but they do not flower. We also have a lot of deer that visit our backyard, and so that probably contributes to it if they find them before we do. So I'm in a fully south-facing part of Fort Hill, 
still not out and uh, up on top but as i mentioned this side of the hill would be warmer and drier given it, it's its relative exposure to the sun and a hallmark of in terms of trees that like warmer drier sites in ohio is chestnut oak which we see all the time when we visit southern ohio and so here it is here at port hill okay our our old friend chestnut oak with this thick furrowed bark it's uh, basically covering this south side of the hill several in front of me here uh, but we did not see it on the north side of the hill where it's a lot moister um, and i can see a lot of them out in the distance from me as well all right so we're almost to the point where we're going to ascend to the top of ford hill but there's another tree over here another old friend at this point in our our history there's a nice shag bark hickory over here nice shaggy one again okay that's a nice uh nice one that looks like uh, a piece of tinder you might use to start a fire with you know, back in boy scout days all right so so let's keep moving well here's our geology lesson for the day this this wind throw pulled up some soil and rock from below and, and is revealing some of the substrate here, some of the substratum. Uh, this is shale. All right, so you can really see shale is a kind of a thin uh, clay deposit uh, type formation uh, that flakes off in these plates um, and is associated with uh, coal deposits as well, okay? but shale can be found anywhere there was deposition um, and you can see it's black it's dark i think shale has a reasonably high carbon content I, you can't really burn it but it is you know um kind of on its way to being coal uh partly uh um but in any case that's shale and this flow down revealed what you can find underneath this you can see this kind of thing alongside the stream as well, shale banks. And so all throughout central Ohio, there are a lot of streams and rivers with shale banks. Uh, of course, there's sandstone underneath these, these rocks, underneath this uh, soil as well. So, but that's shale. Well, as I walked over here to show you that shale, I realized there's an abundance of service berries in bloom over here. All right, so service berry is a nice spring flowering native tree. Um, it makes these nice white flowers. Some of them have a pinkish cast to them. And, um, and especially when they're still in bud, they have a more pinkish cast. But uh, this is a nice native tree, a small tree. Uh, and it is planted ornamentally increasingly. So service berry is one of our native trees that was adopted into the ornamental plant industry. I uh, like flowering dogwoods and those sorts of things. It's about the size they get uh, because of this nice floral display you get in the early spring. And then they actually make a fruit that you can eat as well. I've never eaten service berries, but uh, I'm gonna try that. Maybe I'll do that on the naturalist as well. So just below me about 200 feet, the Fort Trail takes a turn to head up the hill into the earthwork proper, to the top of the hill. I'm pausing to catch my breath because it's steep here, but also to show you this plant over here that is sprawling all over the place. It looks like a real invasive mess, but it's a native. That's greenbrier. Okay, and it's a thorny native plant. These green stems, it'll make shiny green leaves in the spring it makes a, a bluish fruit i see a couple of fruits still on it i grab a couple of those there are the fruits oops <laughs> trying to get my angles and i lost the fruit okay they look like a huckleberry sort of okay and that's an important fruit for wildlife and that makes me re remember that uh let's see i First came to Ford Hill probably about 25 years ago. And on one of those early trips um, was, was when I saw a ruffed grouse for the last time uh, ever, frankly, okay? 
Ruffed grouse are a, um, a fairly large bird. They're a game bird. Okay, you could hunt them. We would pursue them in Pennsylvania and you, I don't know if you still can in Ohio because they're so rare, but they basically are disappearing. They're disappearing across Pennsylvania and across Ohio. When I was a kid, I remember seeing groups of like 30 ruffed grouse uh, take off at once. And now it's very rare to see one. But Fort Hill was one of the last places I, I saw ruffed grouse. And uh, they're really interesting birds. They do this mating ritual where the males will drum and make these drum beats off in the distance. Um, you have no idea that a, if you don't know ruffed grouse, you have no idea that a bird is making that noise. Uh, and then when they, when they take off, when you flush them and they take off and they surprise you, they just thunder off, scare the crap out of you usually, okay? They're a, uh, you know, like a qu little bit bigger than a quail sized bird, uh, much smaller than a chicken, for example, um, smaller than a pheasant even. But I talk about ruffed grouse because this is the kind of habitat that ruffed grouse like. They like brushy habitats, food producing shrubs and vines. I see grape vines mixed into this mess here in front of me. So grapes would be an important fruit. They also eat buds of trees and shrubs. Uh, they like the buds of aspen trees, for example. That's a favorite food of ruffed grouse. So this is the kind of habitat that ruffed grouse like. That's probably why I did see one here once, but I, uh, I don't imagine you can see them here anymore. In fact, they're very hard to see in Ohio and even Pennsylvania anymore uh, for somewhat unknown reasons. Um, it does have to do with, though, the maturity of forests. As forests grow up and get larger with bigger trees, more densely shading canopies, you get less of this open, brushy habitat. And this is what they like. And if that goes away, that's their habitat goes away. So that seems to be part of it. Okay, now I'm going to continue. I'll just keep filming as I take us through the formal entrance to Fort Hill and through the earthwork. All right, so I'm ascending this hill. And it's, again, it's quite steep. <laughs> if you look over here to the side of me, almost to the top, there's something like 33 openings in the earthwork, okay, where I guess just to make it easy for people to come and go. I think the earthwork was anywhere between uh, five feet tall in some places to 15 feet tall or so in other places. And when you get here, you know, it's weathered. It can kind of be hard to see, but what you're seeing in front of me, with these trees growing on it, okay? You see a, a rise there at the lip of the, of the hill. There's a giant chestnut oak over there, in fact, a couple of them, uh, accompanied by a depression here, okay, a ditch, if you will. That's the earthwork, okay? It sur basically surrounds the top of the hill. It had rocks at its core. It was covered by dirt that was, you know, undoubtedly dug from this depressional area here and piled up like a lip at the edge of the hill. And so this kind of earthwork uh, surrounds the entire top of Ford Hill, which is a really relatively flat topped hill. And uh, this was done, as I said down below, 2000 years ago by the Hopewell peoples. And it's still here. You know, it might not look that dramatic. It's worn. It's been here for 2000 years. <laughs> So uh, they built it well enough at that time to, uh, to withstand, to withstand the, the uh, you know, tests of time. And here's an example of like one of the little openings that would have been uh, made through the, through the wall, through the earthen wall right here. And again, about 33 of those exist. So this is just our first look at it. I'll stop and look at it at other places along the way as well. But boy, I did want to stop and admire this, these chestnut oaks. There's a giant chestnut oak right here, um, right on top the wall. So that tree's not 2000 years old, but that tree's probably, geez, three, 300 or more, I'd say at least. 
I think I'm gonna get a measurement on it. I see some dieback in it up there, but that's a big chestnut oak. There's another one right over there. These are slow growing trees. So to get to this size, they've gotta be old. Okay, 300 years old or more. All right, so I'm gonna take a, just take a measurement off camera and I'll report to you about how big that thing was. And then we'll take a peek at some other spots of the earthwork and some other highlights on top of the uh, Fort Hill proper. Mm -hmm.